right, so I think we 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 should start. And uh, let me uh, first and foremost uh, uh, welcome Professor Michael Posner and everybody else who is joining uh, us on this program. I would provide a very brief introduction to Mike Posner, although he needs no introduction, at least to those who are in cognitive science or in allied areas. Uh, uh, Mike Posner is, is uh, name, his name is synonymous, I would say, with the study of attention. And uh, if uh, you look around, uh, you know, what we know about attention, at least since, let's say, the Second World War. Uh, so you find Michael's work predominant in many spheres. And Professor Posner has been uh, uh, he has been teaching at Oregon, I think, since several decades, where he still uh, is an emeritus professor and has other affiliations with other uh, universities. So Mike Posner's work pre uh, began uh, in the early 70s uh, with uh, his uh, now famous book, The Chronometric Explorations of the Mind. Uh, and then he was one of the first users of the modern neuroimaging methods with uh, Marcus Weissel, uh, PET. We don't use that anymore. Uh, but then he was one of the first cognitive neuroscientists who found out the brain networks for important uh, you know, uh, cognitive functions with visual words and so on and so forth. So Mike has explored the study of mind using attention as a, as a main vehicle in, with multiple tools. And now today we see him talking about optogenetics. And it's rare to find a cognitive psychologist, if I may call him so, talking and including a biological method or referring to studies with animals more directly because we see in the field great divisions and uh, at times, methodological conflicts, what explain, what doesn't explain. And so in that sense, we are very happy to have Michael Posner on this program. And I would say it's historic in some sense to have a legendary personality talking to us straight in these difficult times. Now, <clears throat> so thank you, uh, Michael, for accepting the invitation and having the time uh, for the talk, and I'm quite sure that many people are joining and they'll join, and there will be a fantastic Q&A session at the end. So a couple of words about this program. We uh, are from University of Hyderabad, which is a, a very well-known research university, of it, one of the top research universities of India, and uh, the Center for New and Cognitive Science, of which I am a part. We started this interdisciplinary uh, forum uh, by inviting eminent personalities to talk about their work. The primary motive is to uh, popularize uh, the work that has been done in <clears throat> cognitive science, mind-brain sciences in, in general. And so far we have had the opportunity to hear many important uh, scholars across the field. And we hope that it has helped uh, a lot of people find some interest and connect to uh, cognitive science, because cognitive science is a growing field in India, and it's just an attempt to uh, bring uh, the researchers and um, people who are not in the field directly, but they are interested much closer so that there can be some interaction. So I welcome all the audience who have been attending uh, this program, and uh, <clears throat> we are very happy that they have uh, encouraged us by, uh, by attending. Couple of words uh, before we uh, we request Michael to uh, go ahead and give his talk. Uh, we would have a Q and A day at the at the end, but but Michael prefers that uh, any audience, uh, anybody who wants to ask a question, kindly use uh, the texting mechanism by typing out a question, and Michael will read them and respond to them. Uh, but that's at the end of the end of the talk. Uh, I, I request that kindly do not start typing your questions while the talk is on. 
Um, so this is uh, just a housekeeping uh, stuff. So uh, with this, without further ado, I would request uh, uh, Michael thanking him again for joining us uh, uh, to deliver uh, his, his, his lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be in India again, even virtually. I've been to India four times previously in person. It's definitely a lot easier to sit in your basement and talk to people than fly across the world. But uh, of course you miss out on some things too. I do appreciate your typing in the questions because at my age hearing has all become rather difficult and that will help me be able to try to answer the question. Uh, optogenetics provides a method for examining the and controlling sets of neurons. I'm going to primarily focus on what we might learn as cognitive scientists from studying optogenetics primarily in rodents. Now, you might think at first that the rodent is too far from cognitive science to give us much information. There are some striking similarities between the human performance in cognitive tasks and those of other animals, monkeys, but also rats as well. Uh, you can see here a very simple cueing task where your attention is brought to some place in the visual field, and then you either get a target at that location or somewhere else in the visual field. When it's at that location, you call it valid cue, and when it's at some other location, you call it an invalid cue. You can see that although humans are a little bit faster than uh, rats and monkeys, some of that is due to the method of measuring, but um, you can see that the effects of the cue are remarkably similar. Also for alerting cues and orienting cues, the effects between the rodents and the human are remarkably similar. Most of the optogenetics being done these days is with mice. And just a study came out just this year in neuropsychopharmacology, adapting this same task to mice. And you can see that although the mice are a bit slower, most of that is due to the touch screen method, but the mice are a little bit slower than the other animals we saw, but the cueing effects are remarkably similar. Surprisingly enough, both when you give a cue at the target location and when you give a symbolic cue that just tells the mouse through learning that it's going to occur at that location, you still get a nice validity effect. So at the level of cognitive operations, which is the way most cognitive scientists try to disassemble even complicated tasks, there is some evidence that the rodent might give us some important information. And in this talk, I'll try to apply and describe our recent work in modulating the human brain and using the rodent to try to see exactly what that modulation did. You might think of it as a way of validating methods that are obtained from functional magnetic resonance imaging to actually observe the changes, in this case in white matter, that occur in the monkey brain uh, directly through electromicroscopy. This uh, work goes back to methods of studying meditation training using a form of mindfulness meditation that my colleague Yuan Tong has developed, which he calls Integrated Body-Mind Training, IBMT. It's a pretty classical method of mindfulness meditation. And Yuan suggested that because he could get people to develop a skill, not of course a final skill, but at least a measurable skill in five days, 
that we could study this in a way in which uh, more neuroscientists are interested in our findings. So in our original studies, uh, we trained in mindfulness meditation compared to a plausible control relaxation training, which is learning to relax each muscle using uh, and very useful in cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's a common method of improving brain processes. Nonetheless, we found that within five days, we improved attention as measured by the attention network test, executive attention, uh, greatly improved both uh, positive and negative moods as reported by palms and by objective measures of cortisol secretion, reduce the level of stress. However, after two to four weeks of training, we found in addition to uh, improved attention over five days, uh, like a dose dependent kind of attentional effect and also cortisol effect, we also found changes in white matter all around the anterior cingulate gyrus, all of these tracts showed improvement in function, fractional anisotropy done by diffusion tensor imaging. Now, most people in cognitive psychology and cognitive science think of fractional anisotropy as a method of measuring the efficiency of white matter. However, despite the fact that we publish these data first in 2010 and then again in 2012, where we used uh, different measures of MRI, there was a lot of skepticism uh, about this finding. How could a purely mental thing, like sitting quietly in a meditative state and training to improve in that, actually change the white matter of the human brain? Even my brother, who's always been one of my strongest supporters said, well, I know you got this result, but it's not likely to be right. So I did something that uh, we frequently ask students to do, but we maybe a little more rarely do ourselves. That is, I examined the literature on changes in white matter. Everyone agreed white matter changed during development from infancy to adulthood, but there was most people believed that once you reached adult, the white matter was fixed. But I found from reading that in the case of multiple sclerosis, where one gets a demyelinating disorder, the brain fights back by activating dormant oleodendrocytes to start myelination, to try to resist the demyelinating process. Uh, I wondered then if this could happen with training. Could we actually activate dormant oleodendrocytes and that would improve myelination and therefore improve connectivity of white matter? I thought if I could show this, maybe my brother would believe me. In any case, uh, I gave a talk not virtually, actually in person, speculating that the mechanism for changing white matter was the frontal theta that's often produced from meditation training. And here in our study, we showed an improved frontal theta rhythm, four to eight, of, uh, four to eight cycles per second rhythm in the frontal area over electrodes that we had shown previously come from the anterior cingulate gyrus. That was the link, I thought. That was the effective ingredients in meditation to produce at least a change in white matter and maybe some of the other effects that we had seen in meditation. When I gave this talk, I was contacted by this man, Chris Neal, who said, oh, well, I could test that idea. And how would he test it, I said? Well, I would get a mouse and I would make sure that his interneurons in the anterior cingulate 
could be changed by lasers, which we would implant in the, in, in the interior cingulate. And I would use optogenetics to impose a theta rhythm in the frontal lobe of the mouse. I was amazed by this. Uh, I had heard of optogenetics, but I had not thought of it myself as a method for imposing this in the mouse and testing my ideas. So I put together a team, mostly from Chris's lab, his wife, Denise, who eventually did the electromyography, uh, Aldous Weebel, who I call a mouse whisperer, because he could make mice do things you couldn't imagine a mice doing. Yuan and Gary Lynch, who served as advisors, and my longtime colleague, Pascal Volker, who carried out genetic studies that I'm not going to talk about in today's talk. So I had a team, all of whom knew much more about what we were doing than I did, but uh, they got mice who had been bred so that it was possible to insert a small amount of DNA into the anterior cingulate and get uh, produce cells, inner neurons within the anterior cingulate that could be either increased in activity or decreased. So we could either suppress activity or increase activity. And we could do so in a theta rhythm. From there, we just chose three, four different uh, groups, one hertz stimulation, eight hertz stimulation, 40 hertz stimulation, way beyond the theta rhythm, and of course, a no laser, no stimulation control that goes through sham surgery and so on. So a well-controlled study of 20 days in which the mice did not meditate, despite what the New York Times said, they did not meditate. Instead, they received theta stimulation within the anterior cingulate, either increasing the output of, uh, from the anterior cingulate or decreasing it rhythmically. And we were able to verify this by recording from electrodes, which were also implanted in the anterior cingulate gyrus. Well, we followed the same methodology as we had used in meditation in the sense that we gave half an hour a day of stimulation for 20 days, just like in the uh, meditation experiments, we either use meditation or relaxation therapy over about 20 sessions, which occurred over a month and so on. So the method was similar in that way, but the uh, mice were only getting theta stimulation. And we found uh, uh, some interesting things. One, oligodendrocytes did increase. We found biochemically that there was an increase in oligodendrocytes specific to the one and eight hertz conditions, the conditions that flank the theta rhythm. We also found a significant reduction in what's called the G ratio, which is the inner axon which is surrounded by myelin. This is axon alone or axon plus myelin. And you can see if the myelin increases, the G ratio decreases. We got a significant decrease in the G ratio in the area near where we were stimulating, the callosum next to the anterior cingulate, but not in more remote areas. So this confirmed that we were act the theta rhythm could actually change the white matter. Of course, that's also what the fractional anisotropy is thought to do, but of course, it's a much more indirect measure. We were able to actually observe individual axons and their myelin sheath through the uh, through electron microscopy. This is sixteen thousand times normal size. And you could actually see the myelin and actually measure its size. So a very pretty direct measure, as one goes, of change in white matter surrounding the anterior cingulate. I'm pleased to announce my brother said, maybe you're right. So I was very happy with that. But of course, you want to see some behavioral changes too. 
And we did find a behavioral change as measured by the time the mouse spent in the light. Now mice, when they're fearful, stay away from the light and given a choice, they'll hang out in the dark part of the uh, white, uh, a light dark box. They hang against the wall, actually. But the more stimulation they got in one and eight hertz, the more time they spend in the light, which is usually interpreted as reduced anxiety or fear in the part of the mouse. So we had shown, I think, and validated the MRI or really diffusion tensor imaging and uh, method. And we also found that both the change in fearfulness or anxiety, which we found following meditation training, was also duplicated in the mouse. And uh, I felt anyway, that this might also solve a problem that many cognitive people interested in meditation. They want you to compare all the different meditation methods of which there are dozens. And you could spend your lifetime trying to do head-to-head -head studies between one meditation uh, approach and another. I say, well, another way of thinking about it is find out how much frontal theta they produce and guess that the meditation that produces the more frontal theta will at least show more white matter change and perhaps also some of the other good things that meditation did. And we found many good things that occur from meditation training. But we wanted to go a step further. Meditation only changes white matter in the area which the meditation training influences, which it turns out to be a very important part of the human brain, the anterior cingulate, which is a key node in the executive attention network. So it's important, but we wanted to go a little further and ask, could we change white matter anywhere in the human brain? We having some clinical relevance because there are many demyelinating disorders, uh, not only multiple sclerosis, but concussion, very big issue in the United States due to American football's uh, effects on concussion. So on concussion, stroke, and uh, many other disorders. And so uh, we hope that we would be able to do this in the human brain. I'll just announce in advance that we failed. But I hope that we'll learn something from the failure. And of course, one thing you want students to know is try not to give up even if you fail because it's always likely an experiment if it's at the cutting edge of the field will fail. So we used many methods of trying to establish an increase in intrinsic theta. We used stimulation electrically over electrodes in the frontal area here, which we know relate to the anterior cingulate. So we used electrical recording. We used auditory theta because auditory theta was said to be soothing and changing mood and so some. So we used auditory theta. We used biofeedback. And of course we had a no a practice control. So we compared these uh, three methods with a no practice control. And we did it either alone, stimulation alone, whether it was electrical or auditory or biofeedback, or together with a task which activated the same area. Our first effort was the anterior cingulate. So we chose the attention network test. We chose the flanker essentially where you put a target surrounded by compatible or incompatible flankers. So this is the ant and you can notice that you compare congruent and incongruent trials which we know activate the anterior cingulate. The rest of the slide is kind of irrelevant for this talk but it introduces the rest of the ant. And we, for the electrical condition, use this set of electrodes, which we could compare with a more remote set. This is the motor, primary motor cortex. We also, in a later experiment, worked to see if we could 
uh, change intrinsic theta in the primary motor cortex as well, because we wanted to claim if we found in change in intrinsic theta that we could do it anywhere, anywhere in the brain. In this case, we use generic electrodes. Everyone had the same electrodes, which we knew were closely related to the anterior cingulate. Later, we used a model to get individual electrodes for each person. Our findings were very simple. Electrical stimulation alone worked a little bit, significantly, but not very strongly. Stimulation plus ant worked very well for electrical stimulation, somewhat for auditory stimulation, although this effect was not quite significant. So it's possible that it could work with auditory stimulation. In our hands, biofeedback didn't work, probably because we were a little unskilled in doing the biofeedback. I'm sure in more skilled hands, it might work or it might not. So this uh, gave us a method to, of choice. Electrical stimulation plus ant was our method of choice. And we did an experiment to see if we could also improve intrinsic theta more than a baseline um, with, um, in the uh, primary motor area. And we were successful also in the primary motor area. And we thought to ourselves, although I don't think I would ever publish this, that if we could do it in these two areas, it, we just had to be inventive enough we could get a, from the model, we could get the right electrodes to do it any place in the brain. A good cognitive psychologist, and I consider myself a pretty good cognitive psychologist, can always design a task that fits any area. And so I felt to myself, well, if this works, we can do it anywhere in the brain. But to show that it worked, we did, didn't have to just change intrinsic theta, we had to change FA. And to do that, we chose the best method that we had found for changing intrinsic theta, namely using the electrical stimulation uh, and plus the ant. And we did that just as we had done in the mouse and in humans doing meditation. We did it for 20 days, half hour a day. I was the first subject. I can tell you doing the ant for 20 days is about as boring as I told the IRB as the average lecturer at the University of Oregon, they didn't like that very well, but they still allowed us to do the study. And uh, we did do the study and uh, we did get some improvement in overall reaction time. Notice the boredom really showed up. It got so highly variable out to, up, out to the later days. I think this is due to some of the subjects being completely bored. Other subjects being impressed by the, the time they were in experiment kept up the good work. But interestingly enough, the conflict measure, that is the difference between congruent and incongruent flankers continued to improve at least for 15 days, even when the subject didn't show a very good change in reaction time. So those were all pretty favorable results, but we didn't change FA. Uh, this is the experimental area near the place where we stimulate it, near the anterior cingulate. These are the control areas far from the anterior cingulate. The control areas had somewhat stronger fibers, so that's why they had a longer, F, a larger FA. But as far as our prediction goes, this has to go up more than this. And in fact, it, both of them went down a little bit, not significantly. So we fail to change white matter. There may be many reasons for failure. That's one of the hard problems about science. There, if you're a really good design person, you can design it so there's only one explanation for success, but that's rare, but it happens. But there's always many possibilities for failure. For example, our one day experiments improving intrinsic theta only showed a very short term change in intrinsic theta. So it may be the only each time that the intrinsic theta was changed was when we were stimulating. And maybe that wasn't enough because of course, we didn't deliver very much electrical current in the human brain. For one thing, 
things get scattered around in the human brain. So the target area, the anterior cingulate, doesn't get that much of the injected current. Also, of course, in order to get this by the uh, Institutional Review Board, we only use minimal electrical stimulation. Since undergraduates in the US pay pretty high tuition, they wouldn't take any chances that we would do any damage to them and they would lose the tuition payment. I, I personally agree with that idea. So we use very low stimulation. Maybe if we stimulate it longer with more stimulus, we would get a change. Of course, it's also possible that the reason we didn't get a change was because um, we weren't precisely in the anterior cingulate, although we did do a bit more activation of the anterior cingulate with anterior cingulate electrodes than we did of the primary motor area, there was a lot of scattering. So that would be another possibility. And then, as my brother often reminds me, mice aren't people. And it could be that this works in mice, but really doesn't work in people. But against that is the fact that although maybe theta simulation from scalp electrodes don't work in people, we did show meditation did work in people. So I think we learned a lot from the mouse studies, a validation of the FA measure that we could get uh, actual white matter change uh, surrounding the anterior cingulate uh, that could be actually observable by electron microscopy. So we learned a lot, but not everything transferred from the methods that we could use with mice to the methods that we were able to use with human beings. Well, how do you cope with failure? Well, for a while I decided, well, look, I've been retired for 17 years. I, uh, I could just quit. And uh, I was pretty tempted to, but then I got another idea in conjunction with my team, all of whom are a lot younger than I am. Maybe we could penetrate the idea about learning of simple skills by teaching the mouse a simple skill and by seeing the details of what that does to the organization and particularly to the relationship between attention networks. And I'm not gonna talk about the whole network here today, but just the anterior cingulate, which you know is a very important node in the executive attention network. And I won't talk about all of memory, but I will talk about the hippocampus, which I think everyone realizes is a very place, important place for learning associations, at least associations of which one is conscious that is so-called declarative associations. Although it may be not the best language for the mouse. And there are really two pathways by which the anterior cingulate makes interaction with the hippocampus. One is a thalamic, the ACC goes to this thalamic relay station, which goes to the hippocampus. And the other is through the entorhinal cortex and back to the ACC through parietal cortex. So we ask, could we really come to understand these pathways in a more detailed manner by referring them to mouse studies? Again, we used a very simple task. We uh, presented a stimulus in the upper visual field of the mouse who's on a running track ball. And when he got this stimulus, he ran in one direction, but if he got the stimulus in the lower, he ran in another direction. With a mouse whisperer in your team, you can get the mice to learn this in a couple of weeks. You would all probably reach asymptote within a single session. So. Humans are much faster at learning these, particularly if they're described to you in the instructions, but the mice also learn and get to be about 85% correct over trials. And as the mice accuracy improves from the first day to the hundredth day, this is an improvement in reaction time. This is the improvement in accuracy and they both follow, follow roughly power functions, the same as we've found for 
simple and even fairly complex skills in uh, the human. Uh, Fitz and I reported this in a book in 1967 called Human Performance. And John Anderson and his associates have confirmed and greatly extended this idea in many other studies. So once again, the mice are a lot slower. They're a lot longer to learn, but they do roughly what the human does. And we knew where the no crucial nodes were. We placed electrodes, we, we uh, placed uh, lasers in the hippocampus and in the anterior cingulate. We got mice who had been bred so that with insertion of a simple DNA sequence into this area, you could get the, the, uh, uh, the cells to respond to laser light and same in the hippocampus. So we had cells in the uh, inner neurons of the hippocampus and the anterior cingulate that we could turn on, but we could turn off in this study, off by laser light. So we could suppress a particular pathway between the anterior cingulate and the cortex. That is, we could suppress all the pathways between the anterior cingulate and the hippocampus at will. And we did that during the learning of this simple skill and found these are the stages of learning. This is before the animal learns, when he's kind of got the association, when he's clearly got the association and when it's overlearned. This is the anterior cingulate. The blue is suppression. And suppression, although it didn't change reaction time, produces about a 10% change in, um, in accuracy all through the many stages of learning in the ACC. Now, if you know the so-called theory, actually, it's only a paragraph, in the Fitz and Posner book of 1967, you know that there's a cognitive stage of learning that probably is where the ACC should have been most effective. That didn't turn out to be true. It's all through learning. Also, and this was really a complete surprise to us, we expect the hippocampus to have a huge effect. Actually, it only had a small effect late in learning whereas the ACC had a pretty lar much larger effect all through learning. So does attention matter more than, than the association itself? Well, that we couldn't conclude that, but it made us think that might be possible that attention really makes a huge difference in stabilizing the learned association. But you remember that in meditation, we changed the effective connectivity in the human being all around the anterior cingulate. That's what we're doing in the mouse too. If we have a laser light here in the anterior cingulate, maybe not all these pathways, but most of the output is going to be reduced. What we really would like to know is, even more than what we've shown so far, is can we reduce specifically in one particular pathway. And in particular, this is the cognitive science question. Can we uh, separate top down and bottom up? Now, there are no words in cognitive science mentioned more often than top down and bottom up. And there are, no that are, uh, there are none that are more ambiguous either. What do we mean by top down? Well, here I mean, attention's effect on the hippocampus or really strictly the ACC's effect on the hippocampus. Could we separate that from the hippocampus the ACC? That is the association coming to attention versus the attention controlling the formation of the association. And the answer from my colleagues, I wouldn't have known this myself was yes, we can can do this. Even though these fibers are intermixed in the same axonal bundle, so it's not that easy to separate them, they uh, persuaded me that uh, we could develop a method 
where we would be able to separate the ACC's effect on the hippocampus from the hippocampus' effect on the ACC, and also separate, although we haven't done this yet, this pathway from this pathway, that is the androrhinal cortex pathway from the thalamic pathway. So far, you know, this work I'm going to report to you, which is completely unpublished and which I regard as preliminary, even though I do kind of feel it's right. Um, uh, just this pathway and separating this direction from this direction. Well, how do we do this? Well, we use two injections of a virus that pr produces different effects. The first virus we put in, in the thalamic pathway into the thalamus, and it sends its effects both to the ACC and the hippocampus. Then <clears throat> we label we introduce a second virus, which, introdu which introduces a second compound, which labels either ACC neurons or hippocampal neurons. So we can separate if we get the output between the ACC and the hippocampus in that direction, if we inject in the hippocampus will affect just the fibers, the output of the hippocampus, which comes to the ACC. So we can separate top-down attention to memory from memory to attention. I felt this was a really ingenious. Now, uh, by having separate groups of mice that are even either a sham or that get the two viruses, the first one always in the thalamus and the nucleus reunions as far as we can do, and we can do pretty well. And then also either, then a group that either has the ACC injection or the hippocampal injection. And the results with the first five mice in each group were straightforward. If we suppressed the top down, we got a 10% effect on accuracy, maybe a little bit more than 10% that lasted through all the sessions, lasted all the, all the parts of learning that we measured. Into the hippocampus, no effect. The suppression didn't matter. Possible conclusion, tentative, preliminary, maybe you don't want to believe it, that's fine, it could be wrong, but uh, it seemed as though the thalamic pathway was a purely top-down cognitive control of memory pathway. And uh, in support of that idea, but not totally convincing, I don't think we have anything totally convincing, we could compare the size of the effect when we suppress everything coming out of the ACC, with the size of the effect when we just suppress the top-down pathway through the thalamus. This is as big as this. Although the methods are somewhat different, it's pretty clear that when you suppress the top-down, you suppress the as much. And so our preliminary hypothesis is that this pathway is a pure top-down pathway or cognitive control pathway. We haven't done the EC, the entorhinal cortex pathway yet, uh, but I'm going to try to give you some human data from my colleague, Michael Anderson, that might suggest that we're on the right track or might not. Michael Anderson developed what he calls the think, no think task. Couldn't do this in mice because one, they don't think that much and two, you don't know how to tell them not to think about something. But you can tell a human, teach an association, but tell them, look, I'm gonna give you the stimulus, but don't think, suppress the response. You might think about the white elephant. And there are trials in which the human does think and reports to you, he thought about it by mistake. He, he didn't want to, but he did. 
when they are in the no think trials, they activate the anterior cingulate and suppress the hippocampus, just as we saw in the mouse. They have those when they report to you, even though they were instructed not to think, it still came to mind. And there are, I, I, I did think about it. And when that occurs, they activate this area. Now, I, I think you had a visit from Ray Klein, so you may know very well that this area is suspiciously like what would happen if I gave you a cue in the periphery that a target was going to occur there. And in fact, the man who did this experiment with uh, Michael Anderson, task, which he kindly called a Posner task. I never call it that, but anyway, um, he did the spatial cueing task and notice this area on the right side is essentially identical with what you got in the, uh, in the uh, uh, no think, in the times when the no think, the subject thought the thing he wasn't supposed to think about. Moreover, recently, Yuan Tong showed that meditation training does act structurally the size of an area in the posterior cingulate, which is a part of this interrhinal cortex pathway. So meditation does have an effect on this pathway in addition to its white matter change in the uh, ACC output. So, so far, we begin, we think we have the methods for separating the enterhinal pathway from the thalamic pathway. We've only worked on the thalamic pathway and all the data are preliminary, but we think we have the methods to study this. And we think we can separate the top-down effects from the bottom-up effects. And a hypothesis we have is thalamic pathway purely top-down down, enterhinal cortex pathway, purely bottom up, hippocampus through the parietal lobe to the anterior cingulate. That's our idea. And why should that be? You keep cognitive control separate from the retrieved products. It's a kind of separation in the brain between acquisition and retrieval. I don't know how true it is, but of course, this is always important to have something that you think can be investigated with the methods you have. That's what you tell your granting agency, trying to put out the fly that'll lead them to give you the grant. <clears throat> so, so far, we think we have established a method for separating top down and bottom up all within the intrinsic activity of the human, of the, of the, of the brain, albeit the mouse brain, not the human brain. And we have at least beginning to be ideas of how we can relate this to studies of the human brain as well. So this was my effort to recover from failure. I think I'm getting close to the end of my time. And so I'm going to go directly to my summary. <clears throat> and then I wanna open it up to any questions you have. My argument here is that mouse studies may help to illuminate things that we happening in the human brain. We can go further with the mouse <coughs> because of the invasive nature of the optogenetic method. We can really study in detail, not only a part of the brain that's active, but exactly how it's active and what pathway it takes and in what direction. These are really going a lot further to illuminate cognitive theory. And what I hope I've shown in this uh, thing that we really can bring these to bear upon really important cognitive science questions. I also have shown that theta stimulation may improve pathways, at least when it's coupled with meditation in the human brain, and certainly when we do it by, by itself or together with the task in the mouse brain. And uh, I haven't gotten to that, but you may know that Yuan and I published 
a meditation study that we hoped might improve addiction to tobacco. And uh, we did show, I think, pretty convincingly that we did greatly improve the level of smoking of those people. This study was unusual in a smoking improvement study because usually people recruit people who want to quit smoking. But we didn't. They didn't even know it was about smoking. We recruited people to reduce their stress because we had shown that IBMT did reduce stress. And of course, college students are always under stress. So it's very easy to get college students who have stress. Many of them will be smokers. And what we showed is that even when the, study, the subject was had no intention to quit smoking, that when we gave them two weeks of meditation training, both we got an improvement in the frontal striatal pathways, which are thought to be related to addiction, and that it that worked regardless of whether the person intended or even knew that he had quit smoking. Some of the people just really didn't notice that they had quit smoking until we had measured their uh, carbon monoxide output objectively and showed that they had quit smoking. So I do think meditation can help improve addiction. And more recently, in fact, probably this week, a paper came out from another group that showed that this can work. Meditation, a form of meditation, mindfulness meditation can work in improvement from opioid addiction. And as you know, this is a critical problem in the United States because of the widespread opioid addiction. And without knowing about our study, they found that the most likely mechanism was the change in theta over the frontal lobes. So I think meditation can improve addiction And we can leave disorders. And finally, we can be crucial to both human and animal learning. Uh, one, uh, one thing uh, I often uh, uh, you know, ask myself, um, how you visualize the future uh, of studies on attention? As a, as, a, as a phenomena, which is uh, where it is going from now, the next 10 years. Is it, well, more, is um, it more biological? Is it more uh, with this sort of approaches? Or we still keep this philosophical, psychological conceptualization along with it? Well, uh, if I got your uh, question right, you asked me what about the future of attention? Uh, Actually, I think attention is such a critical area of study because it's so fundamental to the condition. Right now, by the way, I had my 84th birthday, so I don't have that long to continue my research, but uh, I'm hopeful that perhaps other people, maybe even me, will continue to examine the detailed mechanisms by which attention manifests itself in the human brain. This is important. But attention is important for many, many things, like education. To the degree you were able to pay attention to my lecture, and as a former Psych 1 teacher, I, I think I'm loud enough to force a little bit on you, even if you don't want to pay attention. Um, your educational process is critical that you maintain attention <clears throat> in order for learning to be efficient. And this is brought to home, <coughs> excuse me, by the pandemic because so much is virtual now. <clears throat> it's so much harder to give a lecture to a people you don't see than it is when you see their faces and you can see whether <coughs> they're attending or not. So attention has important implications for education. <clears throat> it has very important implications for development. 
with my colleague, Mary Rothbard, I've studied attention in infants and young children. Thanks to the Washington University group, we have a method now for studying the brain mechanisms starting even before birth by using resting state MRI. So that now we're at the threshold of being able to say what a change in the brain that's found in resting state MRI, what is the functional consequences of that for the infant? <clears throat> Think about self-regulation. How does the infant learn to regulate his behavior, his emotion and uh, his cognitions? What is the influence of the parents? What is the influence of the school and so on? As we see the developing networks using resting state MRI, we can now translate those into actual behavioral effects. And we've done a little of this, but we've just scratched the threshold or scratched the surface of this very important question of how self-regulation is developed and can we improve it? As psychologists, there's nothing more important than to be able to instruct parents on how they can help to achieve self-regulation in their children. And <clears throat> I, I think this is an important area. So at all levels from the most molecular, I haven't gone into our genetic studies, but they're too, in from the most molecular to the most molar, educational systems, bilingualism, which I know is a very important topic. Well, actually in India, it's multilingualism, not bilingualism. In the US, you can hardly find a bilingual, but in, in, uh, in India, you can find people who know multiple languages. And uh, that's also a very important question. You've had a, a whole session on that with Bell Stock. Um, <clears throat> so there are many places where attention is is going. I think it'll remain a critical area in psychology. I uh, am glad I had a chance to study it while I was able to do experiments, and uh, I'll, I'll continue for as long as I can. That, that satisfactory answer? Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, you focus uh, quite a bit on the functions of ACC, and uh, many people uh, that study cognitive control uh, look at ACC as, as a structure that kind of settles conflict. In the fields where I have uh, you know, been working for a while now, bilingualism so that ACC is uh, highly active in bilingualism. You seem to suggest, if I understood correctly, that ACC is the source of top down attention control, the kind of it sends signals. Uh, it it is a source of attention control in the in the top down. So uh, are you suggesting the, we conceptualize attention and cognitive control rather similarly? Uh, they're not, they're not yes, I, I believe that the executive attention system, which is one network, I've only talked about the ACC, but you know there's areas of the prefrontal cortex. There's a, a underlying basal ganglia and the anterior insula. All those areas work together. Uh, I just use the ACC because you can't study everything. Uh, but the ACC is an important and the link to things we do. One of the things we control is focal attention. Sure. And Focal attention is intimately related to the activity of the ACC. Of course, in one sense, it's related to a very large part of the brain, as my colleague uh, Stanislaus Stehan has, has said, and I think he's right. But the ignition, in my view, the start of this very elaborate process of activating these various areas of the brain and bringing the brain around some thought, assembled to some goal or thought, Initiative is in the, uh, in my view, in the and uses its broad connections, including the so called von Economo, these wrap these uh, uh, highly developed cells which have very, very long connections to various parts of the brain. That's how the brain gets assembled <coughs> in the conscious state. So, attention and consciousness. <laughs>
<coughs> are not synonymous, but they're closely related. Um, and of course, there's other senses of attention. There's a parietally controlled attention, which is very important, oriented to space, which now I see as the act memories in the mind. So um, uh, these will be continued network so that'll be studied and maybe more networks will be found by others that will relate to attention I'd be completely different than, than the ones that I've been a little bit of history how was it studying using PET how was it uh, using PET when started using EEG in the 1960s when I Cambridge to work with uh, a man who had done a lot of work there, uh, uh, Dr. Wilkinson, who was at the, then the Applied Psychology Unit, it's now called the Brain and Cognitive Science Unit. Um, uh, I, 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 I did work uh, using a computer of average transients uh, to study the effect of warning signals on G. I replicated the results that Gray Walter had found uh, with a one second interval between a warning signal and a target, there was a slow uh, drift, uh, DC drift in the EEG. I replicated that. Gray Walter had studied it in detail, but I knew that the adjustment and reaction time came much before one second. It only took a few hundred milliseconds. So I studied the shift that you could see uh, superimposed on the evoked potential before you got the straight DC shift that <coughs> Gray Walter reported. But those used only, only used the temporal aspect of EEG. <clears throat> when actually when, um, when the, Neuroimaging developed. Mark Rakel and I really started it off with positron emission tomography in cognitive area and language studies. Um, when that developed, then you could use EEG to localize. Maybe not with the certainly not with the precision that hemodynamic methods. But the main issue is, if you know up distribution, you can't go from that self in distribution to a generator. But if you know the generator, you can go to the scalp distribution. You can go in that direction. So once you know the generators from MRI studies, you can predict where the, uh, maybe not with absolute precision, but you can predict where the scalp distribution would be. So the EEG became a good method for localization. So when I said during the talk, I know these electrodes get a lot of information from the anterior cingulate. We had a direct study of that. Stanislaus Dehan uh, no, and I, I did a, hear a direct you as well. study of that. Pardon me? Can you hear me? Yes. All right, go, go ahead. Hello? Hello? I did hear someone, but I don't know who it was. Oh. Am I, I supposed to quit because the time is up? Is that, is that what they were saying? Uh, oh. So, okay. So, Michael, we have some audience questions that you can see in your chat box, and you may respond to them to the issues that Michael has discussed or put into the talk. Uh, so, you want me to answer this question before I quit? Uh, can no, this... yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, uh, you uh, may answer some of the questions, and okay. you have some okay. time. Uh, and then the can, this, uh, uh, can this improve chronic sleep deprivation condition with aging, or help professional astronauts or military personnel? This is a very apt question because my colleague Don Tucker is working it now. He's assembled literature, and he is is developing a neuromodulation technique in humans, which can be taken home and he believes improves sleep by brain stimulation. He believes that aging uh, 
the sleep spindles being coordinated and he believes he can restore that coordination through neuromodulation. If he's right, the answer to question one, can this improve chronic sleep deprivation? If you mean neuromodulation by this, yes, it can, we hope. And uh, Don Tucker is working on a method to do so, which he hopes to sell to any aged person. I offered to be the number one person to get this because at my age, sleep is difficult. <clears throat> Second question, sir, thank you very much. I'm a first year student doing a master's conversion psychology course. There was a lot that I didn't understand. I'm sorry about that. I, I hope to make it clear, but I found your lecture very engaging, funny and thought provoking. Well, that's nice. I will take away the importance of attention and learning and remember that mice did not in fact meditate. In other ways, mice and human brains operate in usefully similar ways. I will definitely look out for more mindfulness meditation research. Thank you. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. I guess I won't mention the name. Maybe you know Laura Bridges. And uh, thank you, Laura. Okay, is there one more? Oh, yes. Oh, this is from my old friend, Andy Meechkoff. He's apparently in Newcastle, not at Hyderabad. Oh, oh, he's just thanking me for the talk and saying hello to my wife, who by now may be up. No, still only 7.05 in the morning here in Eugene. And you can see I don't sleep very much. Okay, that's all the questions I had on the, my chat. Oh, wait a minute. Here's one more. Uh, oh, this is from... Uh, Visnavi, uh, do you think the influence of dynamic or very subtle life experience, like probabilistic expectations of attending to a certain stimuli on attention can be studied through neuronal models, particularly to understand mechanisms of attentional control? The answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> for example, this is just an example, but not exhaustive, but my, my colleague, um, Gordon Schulman, showed that although when you do a visual search task, you know, and you're searching the environment looking for a friendly face or whatever, uh, if you uh, get a novel stimulus, an interruption by a novel stimulus, vi sorry, visual search does not activate the executive attention system. Usually it's a, a parietally, uh, parietally governed, the frontal eye fields are active, the, the parietal lobe is active, and some subcortical areas, but the anterior thing is not active. But if you present a novel stimulus, it becomes active. And of course, we know parents with young children, if they get their child, if their child starts to cry and fuss, they present a novel stimulus. And of course, the novel stimulus will produce soothing. That's why they do it. But could it also be training the pathways that lead to executive control? Because according to Schulman, it summons the anterior cingulate. I believe that this is one of the methods, one of many methods where parents influence the development of the self-regulation skills, which of course regulate not only cognition, but also emotions as well. So uh, the answer to this question um, is definitely yes. And uh, I think we can study them through looking at how the pathways change with experience, both by the, during development and even in adults. <clears throat> this is from uh, Catalica. Thanks for the talk. It may seem appropriate. How are alpha and beta wave sounds on YouTube stimulate our brain and mood? Are they proven or they just claim that? Well, it's both. There is <clears throat> certainly some very hard data that alpha rhythms and theta rhythms have very specific influences. The alpha rhythms are very influential during visual search. So if you, if you uh, uh, 
you are able to suppress distractors through producing intrinsic, increasing intrinsic al alpha rhythm from the location of the distractor during visual search. And of course, I've lectured on the theta rhythms. Beta rhythms are also important. So all these rhythms are important, whether they do exactly what is claimed in these various commercial packages. Uh, I think they're overstated, but that's true in all commercials. Everything's always overstated in commercials. We're going through a political season in the United States, and you can definitely see this in the political statements that are made. But there is a truth definitely looking at uh, dissolving the uh, complex uh, EEG into its uh, various frequency bands has given a lot of impetus to studies of the role of frequency in various functions. And uh, so this is both, uh, it is important even though it might be hyped in some cases. I think I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thank right. you for inviting me to hybrid so, Yeah, uh, I think uh, we had a very great time with uh, uh, Professor Michael Posner. And uh, there could be an endless series of questions. I know that uh, we have all kinds of questions on attention. And just to note that more recently, uh, a lot of books have come out in public domain popularizing attention. So it is not that only cognitive psychologists are studying attention, but I see there are books written by journalists uh, on attention, how important it is. But today's talk was just not on attention, but he brought in new techniques that we can use as well as talked of meditation, which we know in many cultures, they have been practiced since Send him any material or any questions that you may have. Uh, so I thank again everyone and thank you, Michael, for giving us the time. Thank you. Good night. Good night. In, there, not here. Yeah. This morning here. Bye. Hope, hope you have a good day. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>